Assalamu alaikum fam. Hope you're doing well. So let's continue our reading of Niccolo Machiavelli, okay? It has been enlightening. This is The Prince and Other Writings and you can learn a lot from this, okay? Not only about how people thought in Italy back then, but what was occurring in these city-state types of areas in Italy. So essentially we were in chapter 5. You will learn quite extensive notes from it and whichever translation you get you should be pretty good. So chapter 5 has for us how cities or principalities are to be administered that used to live under their own laws before they were conquered. So once you get a principality under your wing, under your dominion, you got a city on lock, how are you going to then make that run smoothly now that you've conquered it? So remember, he's very concerned with keeping what you've gotten. Okay, don't forget. Here he goes. As I have said, when those states that are acquired are used to living under their own laws and freedom, there are three ways of holding on to them. Okay, so we got three ways. How are you going to hold on to them and maintain them? Because who wants to lose what they lost, right? The first is to destroy them. <laughs> I mean, come on. But hold on. Think about something here, okay? What did Caesar do in his Gallic Wars? He went around, torched everything, right? So that the Gauls and all the different tribes would not have anything to return to. Genghis Khan, he let, it was before he conquered the Jerkid, they decided to uh, submit to his will. He didn't destroy their infrastructure. Later, they rebelled because they still had their property. So Genghis Khan and his soldiers went back, leveled it, and then rebuilt it under their full control. Okay? A fantasy example would be... Remember when Daenerys Targaryen completely turned King's Landing into ash? There was a lot of symbology there of laying purifying through cleansing and utter destruction right now some would say because this okay hold on let's rewind Genghis Khan had two sons who were competing for a province one of his sons said you want to destroy everything because you know I'm going to inherit it the architecture the buildings the other son said, you just want to sacrifice the soldiers' lives to maintain the buildings through a different strategy. So that was an example of Genghis Khan's own sons having a dispute of, do you maintain the, archi the architecture for your own glory and take it over, or do you destroy it so that you just level everything out and that you don't lose your soldiers' lives? Versus different methods of Genghis Khan had also left some places standing, others not, and then regretted one decision and went back and decimated them. Now, America has done this with nation building, which is pretty stupid, is that you destroy an area and then you pay to rebuild it. And that if you rebuild it, the natives of that area will then be happy, like, oh yeah, you gave us all this stuff, but the gap there is... People will remember you destroyed their traditional things. And even though you built something new in its place, the pain of the initial assault is still there. Okay? So, with all those different examples, just a couple, we can see how you can destroy, but you can also leave up. Because if those people have an attachment to their land that's being colonized, and they have the remembrances of looking at those buildings and areas before they were occupied. They will have more of a love for that area because it has nostalgia. So if you're an occupying force and they're like, remember what it was like when so-and-so wasn't here? But if you level that completely, they have nothing to return to and you can rebuild it for how you want it to look. So it's an interesting thing, but he just goes right off and says destroy it. Oh my goodness. The second, to go and live there in person. So remember, 
to occupy it completely. Remember how he said earlier, if you're going to rule some people that you just recently conquered, you should be involved there. You shouldn't do it from too distant, right? A fantasy example, again, is when Daenerys Targaryen had taken Marine. She left, and as soon as she left, the people started doing whatever they wanted again, right? You can get some prime examples of like that through history as well, in real-world examples. If you want the people to have an affection for you and get used to you, you're there, and then they become kind of habitual and okay. Now, remember in the Federalist Papers, when we were dealing with Alexander Hamilton, he said that the politicians and the government faculties of the federal level and also state level should be in the people's lives so that when they see the government officials or politicians, it should become something very normal. Right? Something habitual to where it's not like, ugh, like absurd, right? So the only way you could do that is by living there in person, right? And by people seeing their leaders, they seem to be like, okay, that's the person in charge, that's the rule, right? But if you're doing something like King George the Third, when he tried to do with the American colonies was to be all the way, you know, in an island over there and then trying to rule the colonies, they're like, you're across the side of the ocean, pal. We don't have to listen to you. We want to be free. We want to have our own country, right? So already, you can see in history the examples of the destroy them model, the go live there model, and the pros and cons of each one, right? One could argue that one of the problems Rome had was it extended so far that people were just like, hey... We're under, you know, Roman rule, but when was the last time we saw a Caesar, right? You know what I mean? We just see the Centurions and the legions. We're not in love with them. We don't feel like we are Romans, but we are occupied by Romans, right? So, again, it depends on what you want to facilitate here. The third, to allow them to live under their own laws, exacting tribute from them and creating a government there within the state composed of a few people who will keep it friendly toward you. Ah, so having a vassal, right? A vassal state. That is what Octavius tried to do with Alexandria and Egypt. So, uh, before Caesar died, right, there was talks of both Pompey, Mark Antony, Gaius Julius Caesar, um, Octavius Augustus, <clears throat> they're the same person, but Egypt was like, okay, we're going to have Egypt as a province, right? We're going to have it trade with us. It's independent, but yet it's not. Yet we're going to have our troops there. Yet they're going to give us Egyptian bread. And we're going to have, you know, this exchange relationship. Let them have their religion. But at the same time, they will give us what we want in exchange for soldiers. And they will be friendly towards us. Uh, that is a good example. The relationship between Italy and Egypt is a is a prime example of his uh, third example right now today mm, i wouldn't say the indian reservations the indian reservations in america live under their own laws but they don't do tribute uh, they don't give tribute now one could argue that the aztecs when they rule the other tribes they paid tribute and the tribes were able to live by the laws that they wanted, right? Yet they had to pay salt tax, like they had to give feathers and tribute to Montezuma and, you know, the, lead, the leading Aztecs. But then again, one could argue they were the same paganistic religion. So it depends, right? It really depends, but you can see the examples there uh, of how that would be. For this government, being created by the prince, knows that it cannot stand without his friendship and power. So, what do you need from the prince is you need his friendship and his power. So, the prince recognizes what he has to offer and the people recognize what they have to gain. And has to do all it can to keep them. So, notice this emphasis on having to keep them in line. Right? So, if you're going to do that model of having them pay tribute... They need to see you as friendly, 
and that you're the power source. And then one could argue if they fail in that, you destroy them uh, or you live there. So it seems like if you went backwards to, um, okay, pay tribute. If you don't pay the tribute, then you're going to live there. And if you live there and they still are rowdy, you genocide them, essentially, right? So you see these models here. And a city used to living in freedom can be held more easily by means of its citizens than in any other way if you want to keep it. So this is interesting. So the citizens, if you get them to actually obey, right, they'll run it more efficiently. They know the ins and the outs. That's going to be helpful for you if you want to keep it. One could argue if you do destroy them, there's a saying, if you leave one wolf alive, the sheep are never safe, right? And if you miss somebody in that desecration you've done of their area that you're trying to conquer, and they end up wanting to seek vengeance and raise an army to come after you, and then retake the occupied territory, then you're going to have to deal with maintaining the economy and then not having the locals turn against you as an occupying force, uh, and then having to deal with people who survived, escaped, that raised an army from foreign aid or mercenaries, and then who came back to the land. So he has a lot here to think about. And remember, we're talking about a time period, right, where there isn't the internet strategization is very different. These are people on the battlefield having to put swords in each other, not clicking buttons and sending drones. So it's a much different type of warfare. And Navy is more involved, right? There's not an Air Force. This is a very different style of warfare, which requires different types of strategization. As examples, there are Spartans and the Romans. Oh, the Spartans were really cool, man. Uh, I mean, very amazing. The Spartans held Athens and Thebes by creating within them a government consisting of a few people. Nevertheless, they lost them. In order to hold Capua, Carthage, and Numantia. See, Capua, I remember learning about Capua had some a lot of gladiatorial schools there. And some warriors are really good from Carthage. Man, it would be so cool if people wrote more back then of what they had. The Romans destroyed them, and they did not lose to them. They wanted to hold Greece in almost the same way as the Spartans held it, making it free and living under its own laws, and they did not succeed, so that they were compelled to destroy many cities in that country in order to keep it. So that's an interesting example right there. Rome wanted to take over Greece, couldn't do it, and the Spartans had held it, they succeeded, but they decided, you know what, we're just going to go ahead and destroy some cities and get them to submit. Again, that is a common strategy of history. We can say it's brutal, right? Oh, we don't want that. However, what I have learned is that in today's warfare, people want to take the fight to that country because that country, the host country that holds the war is going to take on the most infrastructure damage. So that is how they do it today, is that, okay, you're going to go over there and fight, destroy everything, a brain drain happens, it collapses the bureaucracy and the, the artisan-skilled class of workers. Only ones left remaining cannot rebuild the infrastructure you destroyed. So you, you leak it and bleed it out. And then that takes over the land as well. So city destruction happens today too, but in a different style, but the end goal being the same. Trying to get them into the fold, trying to get them to be a satellite to your hegemonic economy. For in truth, there is no sure method of holding them except by destroying them. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> so, oh, it's just so brutal. And whoever becomes the master of a city, accustomed to living in freedom and does not destroy it, may expect to be destroyed by it. Aha! So rebellions, essentially. Revolutions. For during a rebellion, it always takes refuge in the name of liberty and in ancient institutions. Aha! What did he say? Liberty? Ancient institutions. Traditions. Right? Conservatism. Holding on to traditions which are ancient institutions. Spot 
on, right? So, you're there. You're the master of the city. And the people there, they like their culture. They like what's there. And then you occupy it. And then they say, you know what? This person's changing our ways. We don't want them to change our ways. We don't want them to restrict what we had. So, by liberty or by conservative, traditional, ancient institutions, that will then feed the rebellion. And you can completely see the reasoning in that. He is definitely on par with what we would all think. Which are not forgotten either with the passage of time because of benefits of received. Ha! What is he saying? Even if you give them any amount of benefits, the passage of time is not going to make them forget their ancient institutions. It's not going to make them forget their liberty. You may think so, but it's going to take maybe three generations to remove that, that memory. And no matter what one does or foresees, if the inhabitants are not separated or scattered, they will not forget the name that those institutions, and they will have recourse to them instantly at every opportunity. So what is he saying? Separate and scatter them so they cannot regather to do a rebellion around a common cause of either ancient institutions, the traditional conservatism, or in the name of their liberty, right? Their rights that they had. So notice that. They have to be separated and scattered to be atomized, atomized, right? So they cannot group. They group their unified, solid message much harder to deal with. I think someone said in an example of five finger slap versus one solid fist in your face, right? Like, ah, like, you know, it's like much different. Especially if you're the ruler and you just conquered that area. So you can see the reasoning. As Pisa did after 100 years of being held in servitude by the Florentines. So another Italian example. Pisa was under the occupation by the Florentines. I think some people forget that Italy was not always united. There's your refresher. But when cities or countries are used to living under a prince and his family is just extinguished... They being on the one hand used to obeying and on the other not having their old prince cannot unite to choose a prince from among themselves nor do they know how to live as free men. Look at that. They don't know how to live as free men. Do you get that? You get that? So they're, they're, they're accustomed, they're accustomed to being serfs. They don't know how to be liberty. Icons. They don't know how. They're not John Wayne's. They are serfs. And if they can't remember their old prince and there's none of that bloodline remaining, they won't unite as easy. And if you don't let them gather, remember, you scatter them, they can't pick it amongst themselves. Some strategy here. Thus, they are slower to take up arms, and a prince can win them over and assure himself of them with greater ease. So win them over and assure them that he's capable of leading them. But in republics there is greater life, greater hatred, and more desire for vengeance. The memory of their ancient liberty does not and cannot allow them to rest. So republics, ancient liberty, meaning a nation built on laws, a senate, representatives, right? They codify their laws and then you follow those laws. It's not the same as a leader who can write willy-nilly. You see what I'm saying? So they have a much different sense of liberty. Right? So that the most secure way is either to destroy them or to go there to live. <laughs> okay. So there's some couple notes here for us. After the fall of Athens to Sparta in 405 BCE. So look at that. Athens fell to Sparta. Which I've heard funny jokes about. The Athenians being more bookish people and the Spartans being more warriors. Uh, kind of uh, interesting how another example in history of the masculine testosterone warriors conquering the more bookish vegetable eating types, right? Uh, the Jerkid who were conquered by Genghis Khan, his Mongol warriors <clears throat> were definitely stronger than the Jerkid, and it's in the books that are written on this subject they were just completely outmaneuvered they were city artisans they were kind of softer city folk versus uh raiders on the steppe 
right? Running on horseback for 10 days at a time, eating a raw, raw meat, dried raw meat, so jerky, yogurts, and then, you know, drinking horse milk and such. So strong men conquering the weaker, more kind of intelligent men, well, different types of intelligent men. Here we have an example of the Spartans conquering Athens with the same type of stereotype. And today, people say that is what's going to happen to America because of liberal soy boys. <laughs> and that will either be conquered by China or Russia, which is kind of funny, right? The city was ruled by the 30 tyrants until 403. 30 tyrants. When it was liberated by Thrasybulus, Thebes had an oligarchy imposed on it by the Spartans between 389 and 382 BC. So oligarchy. Here's another note here for us. Capua, Carthage, and Numantia were completely destroyed and their population scattered in 211, 146, and 133 BCE, respectively. So cool. Uh, Ca Carthage, Numantia, and Capua, they were destroyed. So that ties us back to his point that was his first point to destroy a place that you have just conquered. So that would be an example for us. The BCE time period, man. Whew. Difficult. The last point here. Pisa was purchased by Florence in 1405 and was mistreated throughout the 15th century. It liberated itself in 1494 when Charles the 7th, 5, 6, 5, 6, 7, 8, Charles the 8th, 8, sorry, invaded Italy, Florence regained it in 1509. So another example of, it's just crazy, man. I mean, Italy had some drama, 15th, 16th century. I mean, woo. No wonder why. And then later on, Mussolini. What you gonna do, fam? Okay, so that was chapter five. How cities or principalities are to be administered that used to live under their own laws before they were conquered. So lots of options in case you want to rule a city.